Welcome to ALD Stories, a series chronicling the personal journeys of the people behind atomic layer deposition, untold stories of the technology, and deep dives into the history, development, and future of ALD. I'm your host, Tyler Myers, bringing you this podcast from Benick, the home of ALD. For episode 22, ALD Stories is glad to welcome back the rock and roll ALD guy himself, Sean Barry from Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Sean is a full professor in the Department of Chemistry at Carleton, where his synthetic chemistry background has curated a group specializing in the development of precursors and processes for atomic layer deposition. Sean initially found himself in ALD as a postdoc in Roy Gordon's group at Harvard before beginning at Carleton, and has claimed some notoriety as the first group to successfully deposit gold using an ALD process. Sean is also the author of Chemistry of Atomic Layer Deposition, a book outlining the core concepts needed for understanding ALD from a chemistry perspective. In this episode, Sean and I discuss his time living and working in Helsinki, why fundamental chemistry is an important and often overlooked concept in understanding ALD, why he decided to write a book, and the different approaches to developing ALD precursors and processes. Sean is an absolute pleasure to talk to, so I'm sure that everybody listening will enjoy hearing his points of view. So please grab your tea or coffee and enjoy Carleton University's Sean Barry. Cold times in Canada now too, just as in Helsinki. Yeah, I think uh, I lived there for a year, eh? Yeah, it, right. Yeah, so I found that um, southern Finland and where I live in Ontario have very similar similar climates, very similar trees, very similar landscape, lots of shield poking through. Um, and then living in Helsinki was like living in Ottawa. When we lived there, it was a ton of snow the year we lived there and cold all the time. That's yeah, quite nice. Actually, yeah. you know, by the way, I should have mentioned this as soon as it got in, but the, it is recording right now. Yeah, it's, I, I heard it say. Okay, great. Yeah. I mean, it's, they tell me, or the internet tells me, always be recording is the first rule of, of podcasting, apparently. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we can do a traditional in, introduction here, but you know, since we're talking about it, I know you've yeah, spent a lot of time in Helsinki and um, yeah, lived here for a year, worked with a lot of people in Helsinki as well. So just out of my own curiosity and for, for the fans, like maybe you can tell us a little bit about your, your time and experience working with some of the ALD people here. Sure. Um, so I, uh, I consider Helsinki my second city. Like if I had to move to a different city, that would be, uh, that would be one. I lived in Boston for several years and I worked for Roy Gordon, of course, and I really loved Boston. And for a long time, I considered it my second city. And then uh, I lived in Helsinki for a year. I worked with, uh, so I, I approached Mark Ruleskala at an ALD conference. And I said, I want to go on sabbatical next year. Can I come to Helsinki? And he, and I, you know, it's pretty resource neutral. I, I was going to do research, so that would cost some money, but I did have, like, I did have funding for that. And there's no salary component. And so I thought it was a no-brainer, and and he said, and this is before I knew Finns very well. He mm-hmm. said, "Well, I I think we'll have to decide." And I was like, "Oh, that doesn't sound great." And so he, I guess he and Miko kind of talked it out, and and then he came back and he said, "Yeah, I think I think it will be okay." And I wasn't accustomed to the kind of Finnish, very linear decision making that the Finns really I really admire and that they really love. They love inclusion and they love to like make sure the decision is made quickly. And then I moved there and um, my wife is like, yeah, once you, even when you visit Finland, you get this Finnish way about you where you don't say anything, you stop talking, you wait for everybody else to finish. And if they don't finish, you just think, well, they obviously don't want to hear what I have to say because they won't stop talking, which is, I I just got there and I was like, oh, I love it here. Um, and my favorite story is like, I was there for a week and I was working with team Timo Hattenka, and I'm gonna that name I didn't say his last name correctly, but he's their synthetic guy, their main synthetic. Yeah, we'll forgive it. <laughs> yeah, and that's a tough. He's got one of the tougher Finnish names, and uh, he didn't fully trust me, which because I'd been there a week, and uh, I was working in the synthetic lab with him, and he was very accommodating. Here's this, and here's that, and I needed a Cougar War apparatus, which is a a kind of like low volatility sublimation apparatus, lots of surface area and a big glass, glass tube in the middle that collects all the material. And I immediately broke the glass piece. It's like it was like setting it up and I just snapped the valve off of it because, right, of course I did. And I went to, to Miko and I'm like, I broke, 
the glass part of the Kugel War. I I have my own funding, so I will replace this. And he's like, oh, don't worry. And I was like, oh, the first week. Um, but it got better from there, and I gained Timon's trust. And then uh, I was babysat by, who was my, oh, it was uh, Marit. And I can't remember her last name. She she got married in between then and now, so she's changed her last name. Um, and she was my babysitter on the Bennett tool. And I, I'm pretty sure after I broke the Kugel Roar, uh, Miko went to Marit and said, this guy's ham-handed, so please don't let him break the Bennett tool. And so then I, I did, uh, I actually developed a copper uh, ALD process on the Bennett plasma tool that they've got in the University of Helsinki. And that's mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah. So you, when you say Mik- Miko, you're speaking of uh, Miko Ritola, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of Mikos there, but yes. Miko Ritola. Yeah. And so he and I became pretty good friends because I lived there a year. Um, he brought my son was two and he brought him a scoot bike like the kind without pedals because his son had just outgrown it and uh yeah and then like we hung out with him and and his family quite a bit and it was a very snowy winter so we'd go tobogganing and this kind of thing that's great yeah Yeah, it's good to hear you know you've had plenty of time to spend here in helsinki like okay i presume that people listening know by now that i'm located in helsinki and it's really such a wonderful place to be in a I certainly share exactly the same same sentiments of when I first moved here. I feel like I've now become a lot quieter or, you know, have learned to be a little bit quieter than, you know, the 26 years I had in the U.S. No, it, it's more than quiet, though. It's reflective. Mm-hmm. That's what I think it is. If you, like, when you and I are talking now, we're kind of talking into and over each other. And that's, in Finland, that doesn't happen. If you don't give a pause, it's like you're not thinking about what somebody has said. And if you're not thinking about what they've said, why would they bother saying it? It's kind of my take on the Finnish approach. Yeah, I can remember when I was first, uh, I don't know if I would call it an interview, but first conversation with somebody here at, at Benick that wasn't uh, somebody in my network already when I was starting to speak about jobs and what kind of opportunities they have. And yeah, I think it was speaking exactly the kind of cadence we are now. And, you know, I kind of got stopped in the middle, like, like, just, you know, wait for me to finish. You'll, you'll have your turn. I'm like, oh, <laughs> red in the face. Like, okay. Yeah. I, I also love that, that, um, the Finns will just say exactly what's on their mind and there's no dressing around it. And right. It's a little bit of a big boy culture. You just gotta be, you've gotta be ready to understand criticism isn't hate. It's just, you know, criticism is what it is. It's plain and plainly stated. And I like that a lot. It isn't appropriate for every culture, but it is certainly appropriate in Finnish culture. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great. Thank you for, you know, first little vignette here on being in Helsinki and we name dropped an important people. And of course, uh, Miko Ritola is friend of the podcast episode yeah. 10, if people haven't watched it at this point. But uh, to you, Sean, Sean Barry from Carleton University in, in Canada, thank you so much for being here again. Now we can do proper introduction. This is not your your first time on the podcast, you were here for episode seven, our conversation about green CBD with uh, Jonas Umfis and, and Henry Peterson and yourself. I'd be pretty excited by somebody trying to re-engineer a chamber to be to allow fractional distillation of the volatile byproducts while preserving the concentration or partial pressure of the precursor. That would be super cool. Really happy to have you here for your own individual episode. So welcome back again. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very honored to to accept this invitation. Yeah, it's it's great. And yeah, we, you know, also have you here because I, I have your your book here, Chemistry of a Time oh, Our Deposition, which I would like yeah, I would like to talk about it a little bit today as well. Um mostly because this this idea of, of the chemistry of AOD to maybe chemists is not like that crazy of an idea, but I think to a lot of people kind of forget that there's fundamental chemistry behind AOD. So um, I'd like to have a, a conversation about that at some point and you know, your motivations for writing this book. But uh, maybe to begin, you know, we can talk a little bit just about your your motivations in general, how you ended up finding yourself working with ALD and like what grabbed you and kept you in the field. Well, that's a big question. So I, I'm a trained synthetic chemist, inorganic synthetic chemist. And when I was in the lab, well-trained as a postdoc, I was pretty great at it. Like I I could make almost anything. 
And I really love that. I really took pride in the aspect that I, I was strongly and, and like very synthetic. And uh, when I was, when I did my PhD, I worked in group 13, aluminum gallium, Indian mainly. And every time we wrote a paper, we needed a reason to be doing the chemistry. We didn't really have a reason. We were just doing new chemistry. But when we did the indium chemistry, our reasoning was indium nitride. And so indium nitride is an important gap, bay and gap semiconductor, 13, 15 semiconductor. And we wrote it up that way. And so for that paper, we sent it to, I believe that was my first chem materials paper in 90, 96, maybe. And uh, so when we sent it, we had taken just the, this indium amide that I'd made and we fried it up in an NMR tube. We didn't do anything important. We just kind of put it in a sand bath and, and heated it up and it made indium nitride. And there are three peaks in the, in the XRD, very characteristic. Well, we just wrote it in and we're like thermolysis how probably happens by this mechanism. And you can make indium nitride very straightforwardly, single source precursor for CVD. That's how we wrote it. That was my introduction. And then uh, I started postdocing and I went to France for a guy named Ronaldo Poli, also strongly synthetic, made things just to make things. And I didn't love it. I moved on to molybdenum chemistry, which we do a lot of now. But then it was very novel to me. And I was good at the chemistry, but we weren't doing it. In my mind, we weren't making anything for any reason. And the reasoning was all catalysis kind of oriented, and I wasn't interested. And so I moved on from that, and I worked for a guy named Art Ruoff at, uh, at Cornell. And Art was a materials scientist, and he wanted to make gallium nitride single crystals for substrates for electronics, microelectronics. And I was like, okay, now we're getting into it. And I did, uh, I don't know, a kind of clever thing, I guess, where the only metal in the periodic table that fixes dinitrogen is lithium. And so I took gallium and lithium and made an alloy and I floated uh, ammonia, a mix of ammonia and dinitrogen over top of it and it made lithium nitride, which then made gallium nitride. So I made gallium nitride with a lot of lithium and that was, so we wrote that up. And, and then we tried a few things to like make gallium nitride into larger and larger single crystals. And the largest I got was like, two millimeters on the largest dimension. So like certainly not a substrate. And uh, Art wanted to, he got actually got funding for uh, making a small business. It, uh, SBIR was the funding. Was he? Sure. And he got $2 million and he's like, we can start a company and you can be like the chief scientific office, chief technical officer. All right, and step up. <laughs> Yeah, right? And he's like, oh, we'll get you a car. Like, he was trying to sweeten the pot. And he was like, we'll give you a raise and you can get a car. We'll pay for your car. Because I had a cr kind of crappy car at the time. And I was like, I don't know if I want to be the CTO of an obviously failing company. Because we can't, like, the company was going to make substrates of gallium nitride, which we could not do. Right. But he somehow got funding for it. And I was like, well, this is not going to work. So I uh, I was reading c &E News, which is the newsletter for the American Chemical Society. And there's an ad from Roy's group in Harvard. And I was like, well, maybe I'll try and go to Harvard. I mean, why not? Right. So I, I got in my crappy car and I drove to Boston and I interviewed with Roy and like, it wasn't even an interview. I went into Roy's office and he's like, so, um, when can you start? Like, like literally 10 seconds in, he's like, well, I need somebody to start in like next two weeks from now. And it has to be that day. I'm like, okay. So I went back and I told Art, I was moving to Boston, and then I moved to Boston. And Roy did CVD at the time, and he was a big name in CVD. Mm -hmm. So I already knew who he was, and I was like, oh, so went there, and I was the only chemist. And then he hired two other postdocs, Dan Taff, who's now at Fuji or something in, in Arizona, and Randy Brumhall Dillard, who is in, uh, it was called Microlis, it's still in Boston, and he's, he, he works there. And we were three synthetic chemists in a group of 15 kind of material scientists. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, Mark Uleskula visited and I went to see his talk and I didn't really think much of it. And it was describing mainly he took, it was an hour long talk and he took 45 minutes to explain how an F-120 reactor works. Right. And then he kind of described a couple of processes and it was ALD. And I was like, oh, it's, it's pretty much CVD. Well, I kind of get it. 
you know, symptom. <laughs> and then Roy, I guess, met him and was really intrigued with the idea and went over to Helsinki to see the reactor and came back. And then we started doing ALD. Okay. And that, was, that was how I got into it. What, what year is this? That would have been 99. Okay. Yeah. Right on the, on the cusp of the everyday yeah. brain. 98, 98. Very cool. Right around that. And then, uh, and then I was with Roy for a few years. We did a bunch of things, the famous copper amidinate. Uh, I brought that into the group and my buddy Antti Ratu, who is a Finn, lives in Helsinki uh, now. He came over as a postdoc from the University of Helsinki and uh, he got on the, he, he and um, uh, Kim um, Button, I can't remember her name. Her last name is Kim. Uh, they were both postdocs and they were on the deposition side and they had that big nature paper for all the metal deposition and the emidinates. And then it took off from there. And because of Roy's name, uh, it was easier, <laughs> easy for me to get academic, well, Roy's name in Harvard. Um, it was easy for me to get interviews. And so I interviewed at a bunch of universities and my, uh, my twin brother, I have a twin brother, uh, lived in Ottawa. So I interviewed at Carleton. And they offered me a job, and I'm like, great, I'll move there. And my my then girlfriend, uh, now wife, lived here, and my brother lived here. So I was like, great, I'll move to Ottawa, and here I am. And it's been, I've been here, it'll be 20, year, 20 years in July. Okay, that's wonderful. Does your yeah. uh, twin brother share your same interest? Yeah, well, actually, no. He's a computer science guy. He does data security. He works for the Ottawa airport working on okay that. yeah okay far far away <laughs> yeah well science oriented yeah very different okay so presumably then in roy's group you were doing synthetic chem chemistry i would imagine so it's oh yeah only as a matter of fact uh i did a bunch of process development but it was only because auntie and i got along so well that and i i love the guy but he's not a great synthetic chemist great chemist he's great at understanding chemistry but I remember once we made a big batch of copper uh, amidinate, which is actually very straightforward to make. And his came out looking like there's a Finnish dessert that they eat at Easter, which is malted rye. Hey, everybody. Future Tyler here. I just want to apologize to all of the Finns for what you are about to hear after two years in Finland. This is really quite egregious. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Malmi. Pardon me? Malmi. Mal Malmi. Yeah. I I always call it muck muck. It <laughs> like muck. What's the politest way? Yeah, I'll I'll throw a photo up on the video here of it. <laughs> Great. Um and uh his came out looking exactly like that. And of course it's supposed to be clear and colorless and and, and the liquid. And his came out looking like Malmi. And so I was like, let me just clean that. Then he made like he tried to make fifteen grams, which is really the first mistake, right? So I'm like, let me clean that up for you. So I took it and distilled it out and made the, the proper, you got the pre precursor in it. And then, uh, and so since I helped him with the synthesis, I also got involved in the deposition. So I learned a lot about tools and he had made a homemade tool that I still have a picture of. I use it in my notes for my uh, fourth year chemistry class. And um, yeah, and we did all of that early development on essentially a homemade tube furnace ALD system. That sounds like so much fun. Uh, it was it was great, and we like he brought so much expertise and just an innate understanding of the process. And I learned everything I learned about ALD. I learned in Roy's group, but mainly from Auntie Ratu. That's great. Yeah, yeah I, I can sympathize with him because when I first entered grad school, I was doing some synthetic chemistry going to make some some bismuth molecules for OLED applications. And I was also pretty terrible <laughs> at doing synthesis. It, like anything, it's like being a, a, a good cook. You, you can learn it and you can learn to be an excellent cook, but some people just walk into a kitchen and are great at it from the start. And unfortunately, Auntie was not one of them. Yeah, it's actually funny you mentioned cooking because I have a lot of restaurant experience as well. And I was one summer working in the in the kitchen kind of doing like appetizer stuff for this restaurant but our our bread and dessert guy was gone at the time and they asked me hey tyler can you make a chocolate cake for us and i was like yeah sure i can do that They're like here's here's the recipe i'm like great i am a chemistry major i can follow a recipe like no problem 
So, you know, confidently putting everything together, stick it in the oven, come back an hour later and take it out. And uh, half of the cake had risen. It <laughs> tasted of pure, pure cocoa. So yep. I don't know where I went wrong, but uh, that definitely humbled me <laughs> as a chemist as well. Maybe should have been my, my indication that I shouldn't have been doing synthesis at uh, yeah. any point. <laughs> and practice makes perfect. What, everybody can get the skills, but you, right? The first failure determines whether you want the skills or not. Right, right. Well, I can tell you that uh, they didn't give me the opportunity to hone that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this is this is great. So I, I need to, to preface this conversation with the fact that this is a little bit of my way to help uh, some of my colleagues from grad school understand that I actually was doing chemistry in, in grad school. My organic chemist friends who were all doing synthesis said that I was a really just a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer posing as a, as a chemist. And I shouldn't have been <laughs> in the chemistry in the chemistry program. But what you do, what you wrote, wrote in this book is all very, very fundamental chemistry. It's all synthetic uh, chemistry and takes a very detailed and, and comprehensive understanding of, of chemistry, basics, acid-based chemistry, a lot of the times to understand what is what is going on here. Um, yeah, maybe maybe first let's talk about before I go to your to your book, this kind of uh, kind of saga of, of gold deposition has happened, and I know that you have talked about this in many many occasions on uh, podcasts in the, in the past and, and YouTube channels and and the like. But um, since you were the first group to do a gold ALD process, and now recently at the University of Helsinki they have had what I think is now the fourth gold deposition process. Yeah. Third or fourth, depending how you count it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my, my, my. But it's shortly, goal. the most recent one is thermal gold. And that's a right. huge step forward. Right. And I have to, I'm going to take this moment to grandstand. I think it's an, I think it's an excellent process. And Chem Materials uh, desk rejected it. The editor rejected it. Not, it didn't get rejected in in review and would have gone through review and everybody would have loved it and chem materials missed an opportunity because important step forward and it's a really great process it takes chuck winters um reducing agent and modifies it to work with gold and then uses gold chloride which is very touchy stuff to work with it's a really excellent process and it i'm i'm happy I, I would have loved to have discovered a thermal process for gold, but I'm very happy that they discovered this. And it it didn't get, it got the recognition it deserved, but it it didn't end up in chem materials, the kind of ALD journal record. Right, right, as it, as it probably should have. And yeah, I mean, as as somebody who you know, worked on this process, and I know at the time, this was 20, 2015, 2016, mm -hmm. uh, it was something to be super proud of, first time depositing gold in, a, in an ALD type process. But now, as it's kind of evolved with a, with a few different processes, I'd like to hear your thoughts on you know, how understanding just you know, chemistry is how we kind of got to these got to these places that it's not just a a trivial thing to make an ALD process like this happen. Yeah, yeah, I think gold's a good example because so we're working a lot on molybdenum, for instance, and molybdenum wants to stay out of the molecule. And you've got to kind of, you've got to move it into the metal. And that's, you've got to get the right reduction conditions for that to occur, let's suppose. Gold is the exact opposite. Gold loves to reduce itself and it loves to be a metal. And gold loves nothing better than to bond to gold. That's what it wants. It wants to no other bonds except to gold. Sometimes to sulfur, but mostly to gold. That's what it wants. So the trick isn't to get the gold on the surface. The trick is to get the gold cation into the gas phase. If you can do that, you can at least do CVD because all you have to do is crank up the furnace. Mm -hmm. So the real trick and what we did, uh, Matt Griffiths, who now works at LAM, uh, did in my group, and what uh, Timo has done in the Helsinki group is pick the appropriate gold precursor that it holds itself together long enough to get it into the furnace. And then from there, it's very different mechanistic chemistry depending on, on which way you go, thermal or plasma. Uh, 
for a reduction. And so we, because we did the first one, we just, you know, we just padded the gold with every ligand that it wouldn't let go of to, to make it thermally robust. And it's only thermally robust up to 130 degrees. It's not, not even that you could put it in an oven in a kitchen and it would fall apart. So it wasn't, but we could get it into the furnace and then we had, we'd done such a good job making bonds to the gold that we had to hit it with plasma to get the bonds to break. We did it with oxygen plasma. And um, then we had to use water to get the phosphorus in because there's a phosphine mm -hmm. in that. Um, but when we ported it over to Ghent, they were doing the mechanistic study with us. Um, they have a hive access and we've got a flow system. I, we did it on a, on a PicoSun tool and they did it on a homemade tool. And their high vac system, they could knock all the ligands off, but they couldn't get the phosphorus in. And the water just wasn't living long enough at the surface to do the, to react with the phosphorus. And we said, just do a super long, highly, highly concentrated water pulse. And they were like, absolutely not. That will destroy the tool. But they have gas handling that we don't have, so they could go to a higher hydrogen concentration. So they actually got reduction with dihydrogen, actually hydrogen radical from plasma, which we tried and, and couldn't do because we can't go over 7% here for safety reasons, and they can go up to pure hydrogen. Okay. And which is, I think, a great, anybody doing ELD, it's a great demonstration that um, processes are tool dependent. And mm -hmm. your, your tool really determines how well a process will work. And porting it into a different tool is as much work as establishing the process initially. Yeah, I, I can say from like industry perspective too here, and we have people sometimes messaging us like, hey, we need a recipe for this TFS 200, for instance. And mm -hmm. yeah, we have to tell them like, well, you know, we can give you a, a standardized one, but you're going to have to play around with it. It's not yes. just a one-to-one -one translate to you. Yeah, and we've we've now we worked it up on our uh, we worked it up on our homemade tool on our Picosun tool on the Hivac system at Ghent, which is a homemade tool, and on Ruud Van Omen's um, uh, flow system. Uh, what's it called? Fluidized bed system. Mm -hmm. And there we had to go to ozone because you can't get radicals through a flu fluidized bed unless you thin it out really well. And right, I'm doing no favors here by explaining this because it's uh, it's engineering of the highest order. But you just can't get radical through a fluidized bed because there's so much there's so many mass bodies that they combine too way too quickly. And so we had to go to ozone in that case. So we've like our gold process kind of went in three different directions. And then the Helsinki had initially had their thiolate precursor, and now they've got the chloride with this germanium pre, uh, reducing agent. Yeah, it's it's amazing to see how it has has progressed from just you know we you know are gonna not 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 essentially not optimizing, but we're just gonna get the process done in any way that we can to to move into the most maybe um, like ALD like or the most tangible ALD type process that that people might understand. Well, I, and I think it's more than that. I think um, if I might speak to Miko's thought process here, um, the more fundamental you make it, the more thermal you make it at low temperature and robust and stable, the more people that can work on it. The more people that can work on it. So the precursor and the reducing agent have to be readily available or easy to make. The process has to be simple to do on any tool. And the more people that work on it, uh, from the materials side, the more applications will come out of it. Everybody can imagine what gold applications are, but people aren't realizing them in, in actuality because the precursors aren't fully available. And so until we have a whole bunch of gold precursors that you can pick and choose for your application, it's not going to move forward from a, a development. And so that's why there's so much value in a thermal process even though the, our plasma process works very well, in my opinion, the thermal process moves the football down the field. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have to ask when, when you first were working on this and you know, were successful at you know, you and Ed Matt's and your, your group, did you have any like, uh, any, you know, funny, silly question that people might've asked you about, you know, what can you do <laughs> with gold deposition? Was it, you know, for people? Oh. 
presuming it's alchemy at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, our our um, our TOC uses alchemical symbols because it. And I I gave it a talk called the new alchemy. Uh, turning gold into gold because we would take bulk gold we would dissolve it down into auric acid we would then transfer that into a gold one chloride then we would uh oxidatively add ligands to it until it was a gold three trimethyl trimethylphosphine that's the precursor uh so we would go from bulk metallic gold down to the precursor and then to thin films of gold and so that we the joke was we're doing the simplest kind of alchemy but um, yeah, when we, there, there's really two people. One, like, okay, that's great, but what does it really do, right? Uh, and then there's people that are like, gold. I've heard, I've heard of gold. That's valuable, and that's that's really it. And then of course there's people who are like, want to make nanoparticles for sensing heterogeneous catalysis or whatever. But there no, like nobody's using this in microelectronics. Nobody's using it in photovoltaics. And so those applications that drive ALD most of the time, uh, gold isn't really a big player in that. And so a lot of the field, people were like, well, I, you've activated a new box on the periodic table, and that's great. Um, but what are we really going to do with it? Mm -hmm. My answer to that is, that's that's not my job. My job that's is right. <laughs> my job is to make the process. That's why, that's why I work at a university. If I wanted to make a thing to sell to people, I'd work in a company. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Which you 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 gave up that, that yeah. opportunity anyway before going to to Royce Group. So. No, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Um, I I don't think I'd be a very good businessman. I'm not. I'm a much better academic because I'm I'm very strict about understanding things, which is why we work on mechanism. I really like understanding every little tiny move, every little bond breaking and making aspect of everything. Uh, and like, not to pitch the book, but that's why I wrote the book, because the fundamentals of this are so illuminating when you feel, like when you start to get your head around them. I was at a conference with Steve George, and he was talking effectively about electron counts at metal centers. 18 electrons and 16 electrons are like organometallic compounds, one, one of those two. And I, I won't go into it. There's a whole, right, third year inorganic lecture in there. But um, he was he had found a textbook that kind of described it in a chart. And he was like, this is great. This really predict." And he, he said, I think it predicts what we can do. And he kind of looked at me like we're in a, it was in a small conference. And I'm like, yeah, it's predictive. That's predictive. And I'm like, that's great because he's right. Steve George has been doing ALD for like decades and decades. And for him to discover the chemical side of it when he's a material scientist, I was like, this is really, again, this is really making chemistry part of the knowledge base you're, you're required to have. And so when he, he did that, I'm like, yeah, fundamental understanding might not make, you know, a vanadium metal thin, thin film right off the bat, but it'll certainly help you understand what's going wrong with trying to get vanadium into a process in any way. I'm just picking a random metal. Yeah, I don't want to go too deep in the weeds with my my comment here, but uh, certainly I think from Steve's perspective, uh, he's moved into a lot of uh, atomic layer etching processes. Those you only, you cannot I think rely on just uh, you know precursor knowledge that you have in an ALD. They are much more complex, and I think that fundamental understanding has has become extremely important in their their process developments in that group now. Well, in, I think that part, part of the whole field is moving towards mechanism, understanding mechanism. And that's great for my group because that's what we already did. And it's got like, it's suddenly become more important than it was maybe 15, 15 years ago. We were like picking apart why amidinates and guanidinates fall apart in the gas phase and it, whether that's bad or good. And people were like, oh, cool. But Really, we just want copper. We just want copper for interconnection. We want hafnium oxide for, for gate dielectrics. Just please do those. Mm -hmm. And now, now that etch, etch is like too confusing to understand without the chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say, Steve George has, his group has worked on mechanistic chemistry for 20 years since I've been at it. They've been picking away at mechanism. But with 
him and now Stacy Bent and always with Marku Leskalin, Miko Rito. Marku uh, supervised Auntie. Auntie's thesis was on QCM and the mechanisms of ALD. Like that's the whole thesis was was that before I was ever an independent researcher. And so mechanism has always been a narrative that ALD has had, but now it's become important enough that the fundamental aspects of mechanism really need to be understood by engineers and chemists and everybody. Yes. And marketing people. <laughs> well, you know, I I I am a chemist by by training at least. So and when I was when I was working in, in Steve's group, I was kind of doing this um well, we were looking at well, what we call at least in the paper as, as conversion reactions. So the idea that when you have a, a metal precursor coming in, not only is it interacting with the surface, but can interact with underlying substrate as well, which you know, is also very important in etching, of course. But mm -hmm. something like TMA, not just adding aluminum or methylated aluminum surface, but as well kind of interchanging the aluminum with the the zinc on the underlying substrate and turning that into some kind of aluminum aluminum oxide and we did this even with uh like okay if you were doing a zinc oxide deposition and you stopped on the diethyl zinc dose and you have an ethylated surface and you know, we saw that that was still happening and when we were looking at mass spec ir of, of this process at the surface it was just absolutely insane we knew that something was happening but trying to understand the mechanisms and the crazy chemistry that was happening at the surface was, yeah, it was a, a, a sludge. That's for sure. You know, well, and it, right. One thing. So as a chemist, I always talk in reactions and there's a guy on Twitter that I follow and he's kind of a, a crazy guy named Lee Cronin. And he says all sorts of like oddball things where half the time I'm like, I don't know what he's talking about. But he, at one point he said, there's no such thing as a reaction. There's only reactivity. And that is a hundred percent true. And we, we try and steer everything down one road, one reaction pathway, but right. Diethyl zinc hits the surface and it'll try and do a million things. It's got no predetermination except for thermodynamic. And so it can do a million things. It can do like one minor thing and one major thing, or it can do everything in an equal, in equal measures. And as you investigate mechanism further and further, it actually becomes startling that anything works because everything's happening all at once. Every time you do, you change one thing, everything happens. And the fact that we can even model it as like first this surface, then that surface, and that works for us, that's, that's pretty astounding. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so you know, right now we're talking a little bit about some of the topics that are in your in your book here. So chemistry of atomic layer deposition that you published last year. Uh, yeah. uh, I've read it. Twenty twenty, I think it came out Christmas twenty. Came out for the Christmas season in twenty twenty. That's right. I, I've read it. I've read it cover to cover now. I think it's an, an excellent resource. And yeah, as I, I've said a, a couple of times here, that we don't sometimes don't think about ALD when it comes to the actual chemistry of it happening and. Even when I think back to my initial exposure to ALD um, with with Steve, we didn't talk about you know electron counting very much. We didn't talk about acid base chemistry, and the fact that you can kind of understand a little bit of how ALD proceeds without understanding the chemistry is really amazing in in one respect and, and tough in tough in the other. But yeah, as you say, when you start to really dig into the the fundamentals, it opens up in an, an entire new world. And uh, you go through a lot of the types of ALD processes in here, how they relate to the you know, basic inorganic chemistry reactions as, as well, or the metal metal organic. <laughs> get that get that wrong, um, as well as the surface chemistry and everything. Um, is there any part of the book you feel you know is really the, the the bread and butter, like the the most important to? unlocking the key to deposition processes or ALD in general? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think the book is meant to unlock process chemistry. I don't, I think if anything, uh, I think if you're a chemist and you read the book, the idea is that it will tune up your physical chemistry. And you, you said, oh, I was a mechanical engineer disguised as a chemist. I don't think that's true. I think that they're like, you can come in as a physical chemist or a, an synthetic chemists. So those are the two flavors of chemistry you can be. And physical chemistry really is 
the more plumbing and electrical parts of of chemistry. And so you might you might not get like how to make things, but you certainly get what molecules are, what, like where they're going to go in the world. And so um, I think what I'm trying to do is I'm with the book. So interesting story. The real re uh, I wrote the book for two real reasons. One, because I think the fundamentals of chemistry are super important to everything any chemist does, including ALD. And I wanted to write something relatively short that got the point across. Two, a friend of mine became uh, an editor. I don't know. I don't know exactly her title. It's like an intake editor. She mm -hmm. started at De Gruyter's and she, her job was to find people who would write books. And she wrote and she said, would you write an ALD textbook on chemistry? Because there isn't one. And I said, no. And she said, I just started here and I want to like get six books in my first year, whatever her target was. She said, I want, I want to like really overachieve in my first year. And I was like, no. And then she's, so then she let it rest for a bit. She came back and she's like, come on, this, I think this would really go well. Here's, I've seen what, like th this lecture, you could really just kind of incorporate that could be a chapter. And so was, Christine Smith is her name. She lives in Germany now. And, um, I was like, okay, finally I said, okay, sure. I'll do that. And then she's like, great. I'll hand you off to another editor. And I was like, oh, 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 I, right. So I was doing it kind of to help her a little bit. And cause it was the pandemic and nope, there's nothing going on in the group. So I was sitting in my office all day with nothing to do. So I thought, okay, I'll do this. And then I thought, oh, I'll just like chat with Christine once a week and it'll be fun. And then I got handed off to another great editor, but um, yeah, and that's that's the other reason I wrote the book, just because a friend of mine asked me to do it. That's a uh, that that's amazing. Yeah, you know, what a what a good friend <laughs> you are. Yeah. Well, and if we didn't have a pandemic, I probably would have kept saying no, right? Because it takes a lot of time and a lot of like <laughs> thinking about what how this narrative, like even a textbook has a narrative to it, how this narrative evolves from chapter to chapter. And it's, so every chapter I acknowledge somebody. Mm -hmm. And at one point I acknowledge, uh, the third year undergraduate cohort, whenever, what, whoever that is, whatever year it is, because I've had to make these ideas all work together because I teach. And that is, that scholarship. Teaching is scholarship. You learn so much by teaching and that helped me kind of put the book together in what I think is, or from my point of view, what's a logical flow. And so that's, so it, it's really not meant to help you understand how to make a process. It's meant to make it, to give you enough information to make you realize that making a process is a very, very difficult thing to do. So, yeah, I really appreciate the acknowledgement, acknowledge, excuse me, the acknowledgements that you have in the book here. I think it's, um, especially for somebody who is maybe just being introduced to atomic layer deposition, which I think is excellent resource for them to see some of the some of the main people that are working on this and who have been been influential but I'm um, just that it's it's pulling from a lot of different places from all over all over the world as well and really leaning on the expertise and you you see the 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 breadth of, of knowledge that gets incorporated into this field and it's not as one-dimensional as the you know simple sequential self-limiting surface reactions that we you know, often call and define ALT. Yes. Yeah. That's a great starting point. And I think that gets you quite a bit of like basic understanding, but you can't, you can't stay in the field. So if you studied ALD and moved into a different field, that might be enough to understand when somebody brings up ALD, you're like, oh yeah, I kind of get the fundamentals. But you can't stay in the field and have that kind of like lower level theoretical under or, or fundamental understanding of what's going on. You need to advance that. You need to, in order to really change how ALD is done and people are changing it in really, really in, impressive ways. Um, selective area ALD, particularly by small molecule uh, activation or small molecule inhibition, uh, Audrey Macus, it, that like, that's a superb innovation. All about surface energy, and if you don't understand surface energy, you're not really going to understand how that works. And so, you have to evolve your thinking. And I'm trying to take people who have the fundamentals and move them to the next level, not to the top level, but just to the next level. Enough information to
to get them started thinking more deeply. Well, it's really a wonderful resource. And I thank you for, for yeah. writing. I guess I have to thank Christine also for, for yep. pushing you <laughs> to yep. write it because, yeah, like she was correct, there is no resource or well, textbook in, in this type of vein that there is. So you know, for everybody listening um, or watching here, if you have the chance to get your hands on a copy of Chemistry of Atomic Layer Deposition, please do it because it is, uh, it's wonderful. Um, so, so yeah, aside from the book then, uh, I asked this question to, to Chuck Winter, who also works on, on synthetic chemistry and making precursors. And I, I asked him like, what was the, you know, what was the holy grail for him in terms of, of designing a precursor? What, what did he want to, want to make or be, what was the, the shining accomplishment if he could, if he could do it? And I believe he told me that's a positive lithium metal would have been, would have been his. So I, I ask and pose the same question to you if you have a you know or reach a dream for designing a precursor for a particular material Ooh, that's interesting so what we've got a lot of so we do a lot of um practical research with with industrial partners and all of those are are difficult targets to meet because otherwise why would they need us right so but outside of that i think again i'm going to go fundamental and i i have to say uh, I like Chuck. I like having Chuck in the field of ALD because he and I approach uh, synthetic chemistry or not synthetic chemistry, precursor chemistry, very differently. And uh, it's great to have somebody that isn't that doesn't reflect your own ideas back at you, but uh, contrasts and, and compares ideas to you. Chuck's I would consider Chuck much more a thermodynamicist, and I'm much more a kineticist. You want things to be stable, and I want things to be okay enough to get into the reactor. <laughs> And it's it's a little hard personalities. He's he like he likes things to work, and I like things to you know just barely work. They, when things just barely work, I feel like I've dialed the knob just enough to get it to work, and that's that's impressive to me. So along those lines, I don't want to pick a metal or a, well, I so I it'll be a metal it'll be a metal process for sure. But I don't want to pick a metal. I want to pick a class of metals. And and Chuck Winter has done this, and so has the Helsinki Group. Electropositive metals, uh, titanium, particularly titanium. I think Chuck did that. Magnesium, any of the alkali or alkali earth metals, as a stable thin film. Um, zinc, metal, mm-hmm. alloys of iron and anything electropositive. Those are tough, tough problems, and it's because electropositive metals, gold, want to react with gold. Electropositive metals want to react with anything with electrons, which is everything in the world. And so that class of metallic film is so difficult to do. And you can't even really cap it. I remember Chuck, I think when he, I, I'm trying to remember, I think it was titanium and he had a tough time proving that he had made titanium metal because he had to cap it with aluminum oxide or he just brought it in and caught on fire. And so, right, the interface was thickly titanium oxide because it was in an aluminum oxide and the titanium was gettering it. Right. Of course it was. That's the chemist, that's what electropositive metals do. And so he, he gave a presentation at one of the ALD conferences and he, he really spent like eight slides proving that if you thought about it this way, it was really titanium metal and then he had had to do this other chemistry to make it work out. So electropositive metals uh, writ large. Like a lithium, a thin film of lithium metal, first of all, would be great for batteries. And secondly, would be impossible. It 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 either react with oxygen, water, nitrogen, anything, or it'd worm its way into the substrate. Those are those are good targets from my point of view. Because fundamentally you need to know exactly what you're doing. Yeah, it's the the most uh <laughs> Going against the grain of the instincts <laughs> yeah, of, right? uh, of these elements. So yeah. gold was tough to do for because it's on the other side of that. The intermediate metals, not nothing's easy to do, right? Nothing that remains is easy to do. But like there are some metals in there that were like, yeah, I'll just I'll just deposit, no problem. But aluminum, right? You, you can't really do it. Endium you can't do, even though it's less electropositive, but that's because it wants to melt. So that's that's a problem. Low temperature indium, low temperature galling processes. You can can't get those done. But like something like lithium, like 
10 nanometers of lithium on whatever substrate that it won't like dissolve into, effectively dissolve into, um, and then cap it with something that doesn't also react with it. So you know you've got the lithium thin fill. That would be cool. That would be a cool process. It'd be really tailor made <laughs> for for ALD. Just yeah. thinking of you know the fact that ALD is amazing moisture barrier. Might as well throw that cap on top yep. of it while you're in the yep. same chamber. <laughs> well, yeah, lithium yeah, lithium would be a hardcore moisture cap, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, great, Sean. This has been a fantastic conversation. Um, I'm so happy to to have you here and have a conversation just uh, one on one with you. And uh, so, just before we finish up, maybe can you know do the the high level you know professor guru questions and you know ask if you have sure. any advice for for people who are getting into into ALD and then also what are you super excited for as the field is progressing. Well, so coming into the field, I would say uh, get to know people and don't be afraid to approach them. As a matter of fact, if you're watching this, I invite you to come have a beer with me at whatever conference you meet me at. Come up, say hi, shake hands, right? The reason that um, I got to go to Helsinki was because Marco Leskala went out of his way to say hi to me in an airport because he recognized me. And I thought, what a good guy. Hang on, maybe I'll just go to Helsinki. Why? Well, it's obviously the key group in ALD. But I thought I could I could work with that guy. He seems nice and friendly, and I might not have thought that if he was less approachable. And I know that, right? The older you are, um, I'm well above thirty. Um, the older you are, maybe the less approachable you seem. I kind of don't have a demeanor that suggests that you should come talk to me. <laughs> but it's I'm I'm happy to talk to people. I love I like talking to people, particularly new people in the field to learn new things and see why they're there. So the advice would be, right, try and try and buck up and 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 talk to the high level people. They're all accessible, interesting, fun people to hang around with. They're all good people. Um what's got me excited? What's got me excited about ALD? I think I think etch is the most exciting thing happening. I think selective area etch when we get there We'll just like then the toolbox is so expansive that we'll be able to go. How can I put it? Instead of going up and down through trenches, we'll be able to go sideways around. Like we'll be able to build three dimensional structures in in a like micro uh, electromechanical way. Like so that we'll be able to build shapes rather than rely on shapes that were already existing. Right. So if you do pattern transfer either bottom up or top down, the pattern is made some other way. The nanoscale of microelectronics is not made by ALD. It's it's advanced by ALD. But if we can start like getting processes that grow sideways but not up and down, or up and down but not sideways, we can start to build nanostructure. And once we can build nanostructure, we can make shapes. And once we can make shapes, so atomic layer deposition, we've got uh, atomic layer etch, we've got selective area deposition coming along nicely. Selective area edge. There's that's going to that's going to really be a game changer. Yeah, it'll be incredible to have just the atomic layer toolbox as the entire fabrication. Yeah, right, <laughs> everything you want to do, uh, an atomic layer at a time. Which, by the way, kids, is not true. No, open the you. You know, you can learn about it in the book. <laughs> well. Anybody you anybody you ask is like, okay, you know. Put the asterisks next to, <laughs> next yep. to these days. But, well, yeah. when I when I first started talking about it to chemists, somebody would say, "But it's not really a full monolayer." And I'm like, "You've just learned atomic layer depositions, dirty little secret." And now now it's not a secret at all. Nobody expects it to be a full monolayer, right? I think that's great advancement of fundamental understanding. Yeah, I think even when I was working on this initially, not that long ago, 20, 2016, when I I started even then. I think there were still people like, in the chemistry department who weren't asking that question. You know, sometimes uh, you know it took a couple months, even as a new student, to to see. Oh, right, that's uh, you know, it's not exactly as uh, as it seems. So, yeah, it's yeah. fantastic that that's moving along that way. And yeah, let me also echo your your sentiments about talking with people in this field. I think I was 
you know, a little bit timid when I was in grad school to to do this. Many reasons, including just you know, I was struggling with uh, with wanting to be in research and, and these types of things in NA case, which is why I'm in marketing at this uh, at this point. But since I've you know kind of shed the pressure of the research and just been able to interact with the people in the field, it has opened up an incredibly incredibly um, uh, amazing community, uh, incredibly welcoming and um, just friendly in general. So well, yeah, please don't be afraid. <laughs> a good reason for people new to the field to go talk to you at a conference because you've got an, an interesting and different path through the PhD into an, like a fun and interesting career in a great place in the world that is not the traditional academic or industrial pathway. I mean, you're working for industry, of course, but it, right? Like it's, you can learn so much just by talking to people. I, I, when I was a grad student, I didn't love approaching faculty. Mm -hmm. It just made me nervous. And I felt like I'd come across like a, a ding dong and I probably would. And y you probably will a little bit, but that's okay. Everybody's been there. Everybody's grown up through it. Everybody wants to be generous with PhD students and postdocs and people that share an interest with them. They really do, and so, right? Feeling embarrassed is just part of uh, just part of the human interaction aspect of it. <laughs> in my, in my I've even you know felt that way doing this this podcast as well. You know, you, you get it in your head like, oh, you know, I'm going to talk with some people who are pretty well known in the field. I better not say anything wrong, but it's just a learning opportunity at the end of the yeah. day. And I've certainly you know said wrong things on this before, but that's why you talk talk to people. That's what the editing button's for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Nobody's actually heard the wrong things that I've said yet. <laughs> well, wonderful. Sean, thank you again for joining me, uh, Pat. Yeah, just a uh, wonderful time. It's the last hour of my workday here, so I, I couldn't think of a better way to finish off the day. So thanks again for joining me. On this. Great. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to see you in ASD or ALD in Bellevue, but if uh, it if and when I see you again, we should get a beer. Absolutely. I'll be there in right. Bellevue. So let's put it on the calendar. Awesome. I might be a little busy at Bellevue, but I'll, I'll uh, have a beer with you. We'll, we'll, we'll squeeze in a skull if we need to. But... <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Sean. Have a really wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for taking the time out of your morning. And I'm uh, looking forward to seeing you again. Cheers. All right. See you, Sean. Bye-bye. Hey. Bye. Thanks for listening to ALD Stories with Benick. To stay updated on new episodes each month, please follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed the show. I hope to see you again in the next one.